Hi, this is Rob Hawley from the Fremont Peak Observatory. In 2009, I did a video series on how to do star hopping. In November of this year, the Tri-Valley Stargazers asked me to present a, a lecture to them, and so I've updated the material. The original lecture on YouTube mostly still applies, and I encourage you to have a look at the longer and more detailed explanations there. This is my typical scope these days, the 30-inch Challenger Telescope at the Fremont Peak Observatory, but I also continue to use my 10-inch travel scope. Here is how this talk is organized. There are two basic types of finders. The first is called a red dot or a telrad. This is a simple look-through device that projects either a red dot or circles or some other kind of pattern on the sky. Red dot finders are really easy for quickly positioning the telescope but they don't give you a magnified view, so unless you're directly on the object, you can really only use them for gross positioning. Still, they're a critical part of the process. The second type of finder is a magnifying finder. I really prefer this one, the Orion 950 Right Angle Finder. It has a tremendous advantage over look-through finders in that it doesn't invert your image. Thus, it makes star hopping vastly easier and it'll save your neck. Most telescopes that you buy commercially will come with one, but not both. Trust me, you need both. The next thing you need are good charts. This is an area where there's been a lot of change since 2009. The programs I preferred back then are largely no longer maintained, and therefore I'm recommending new programs here. Of course, the paper charts are still the same as existed in 2009, so the same set I recommended in 2009 still apply today if you want to use paper charts. Today the two programs that I would recommend are Cart to Seal, which I'm going to refer to as SkyChart, and Sky Safari Pro 6. SkyChart will run on PCs and Macs. Sky Safari Pro only runs on Macs, but it also runs on iOS and Android, so you can bring it with you into the field on your tablet. Both the programs and your anemetria offer the ability to do field of view circles. Field of view circles represent the amount of sky you would see with a particular set of optics. These make star hopping vastly easier and you'll notice that I use them extensively in the rest of the presentation. Calculate these before you get to the field. Here are some examples of the symbols used on star charts. Globular clusters are marked with a circle with a cross. Open clusters are marked with a dotted circle. Bright and dark nebula are marked either with outlines or with simply squares on some charts. Finally, galaxies are marked with ovals. The ovals may be more elliptical and may mark the direction of the galaxy. If you are using your anemetria, be aware there are three different types of charts there. The S charts at the front of the book are overview charts. They kind of correspond to a visual view of the sky. The Roman numeral pages are a more detailed representation of, a, of the sky and can be used as a basis of starting your star hop. The rest of the book are basically finder charts. Your anemetry only goes to 9-7, so they really aren't very useful for things, for example, like finding Pluto. One of the main tricks of star hopping is to look for patterns. Things like distinctive patterns of stars that form triangles or squares or a run of a set of stars or something that looks unique. Those are going to be your road maps. Just like a road map, star charts present a symbolic view of the sky that you have to map to the real world. Unlike a road map, the optics in your telescope and the position that you look into the telescope are going to introduce distortions that you will have to understand and correct for mentally. Even with your Orion finder, you will find the sky will be rotated from what you see in your charts due to either the charts representing equatorial coordinates or simply the fact that you're rotated relative to your telescope. You will have to correct for this. Let's face it, when you're doing star hopping, it's a lot easier doing it in a really dark sky. A really dark sky like the one shown here gives you many opportunities of stars to start from. Let's find M17 in three different kind of skies. In a sky like that at the Golden State Star Party, you can practically put the telescope on it using just the red dot. 
Here at Fremont Peak there are fewer stars to choose from, but there's still enough to make this an easy star hop. The trick is to find Gamma Scutum, but that's pretty easy. You start from the ring that contains M11 and move down until there's only one star visible, and that's Gamma Scutum. On the other side is Paulus, which is uh, the star right above the, the teapot. Then you just draw a line between the two of them and put your finder there. This is what skies look like in the city. From this location, good luck. Once you have figured out what your optics are doing, the next trick is to try to figure out how to move the scope. Sky Safari Pro makes it really easy if you've got a equatorial mount like the Challenger. It provides you cardinal directions and so you can look at it and just know exactly which way to move knowing that north-south corresponds to deck and east-west corresponds to RA. At first it would seem that trying to do the same thing in a non-tracking scope like my 10 inch would be harder. But there's a little trick. The stars move. If you simply watch the stars they'll move towards the west. That'll tell you your direction and it'll tell you how to move the scope. But in the next section we're going to show you an even easier way by using the guideposts that the sky lays out and moving according to the guideposts rather than worrying about east and west. This is particularly true if you have a non-tracking scope like my 10 inch. Less so if you have a, a scope that has to move an RA and deck. Now we're going to give an example of a real star hop. In this case we're going to find M51, a galaxy that's near Ursa Major it's in CVN, which is the next galaxy over. At TVS, I did this using Uranometria, but since I don't really use Uranometria anymore anyway, we're going to do it for this video using uh, astronomy programs. We'll be using Sky Safari Pro. First, start with a visual image. As you can see, the easiest hop is from Alkalade, which is the star at the tip of the Big Dipper. Here's a closer view that corresponds to what you'd see in the Orion Finder. Let's spend some time on this one because it's important that we pick out the patterns because those are our roadmaps. Look carefully for things such as triangles or unique patterns that we'll use to determine what the rotation is. Again, the path will be from Alkalade to 24 CVN to a triangle that's near M51. That'll be our hop. Now all we need to do is figure out the roadmaps to get us there. And here is where we want to end up, a triangle of stars that is close to M51. The first step is the most important. It's critical that you start on the right star. In this case, it's trivial because Alkalade is a bright star at the end of a well-known constellation. Now let's go to our finder. We need to match the patterns we previously discovered to what we see. That'll give us our rotation and in turn that'll give us our direction of movement. Now we have 24 CVN. Center it in the finder. That's our triangle of stars there on the right. Now center on the triangle. Now it's time to go to the eyepiece. Once at the eyepiece we may have to move around a little bit to get the object, but we'll quickly notice it off to the side. Since we're in the Ursa Major area, let's do another star hop real quick. We'll go to M97, the Owl Nebula, a planetary. The hop begins on one of the stars in the Dipper. We're going to start on Beta Ursa Major and head past M108 towards another, another triangle of stars. Now M108 probably is not going to be visible in the finder, so we're just going to be looking for the stars when we, when we go into the finder. I'm going to leave as an exercise to the listener to work out the details of how to do this. One of the most challenging star hops, and one which I rarely try to do, is to find Pluto. Pluto's tough because it's a magnitude 14 dot, 
and especially now that it's in Sagittarius, it's in a sea of magnitude 14 dots. There's absolutely nothing distinguishing about it. So it relies on perfect star charts and very careful viewing. And usually to confirm that you've seen it, you need to look at it on a couple of nights, preferably adjacent nights. But on June 25th, 2016, we got lucky. It happened to be located near a relatively bright star and near a distinctive pattern of stars. And so we put the challenger on it and had our guests uh, try to look and see it themselves. Let me walk you through what we did. First, here's a star chart that doesn't show Pluto. Notice the area that I've circled. Now here's what we saw in the telescope. Notice anything to the left of that pattern of stars? Just to show you how lucky we were in picking a night, here's Pluto a week later. We tried, but we gave up. All right, the first star hop we'll do is to M65 and company. Start at Theta Leo. From there, move about south to New Leo. As you can see, it's not very far. And then at that point, you're practically on it. Very simple star hop. The next example is finding M22. M22 is just northeast of the top star of the teapot. Finding it with a Telrad is pretty easy. You basically just put the Telrad just a short distance away from that star, and you should be just on it. Finding without a Telrad is a little bit more difficult. What you do then is put the red dot on that top star. Look in the finder, and you'll notice a pattern of five stars on one side of the uh, finder. Well, that's your marker. Center that in the finder, and you should be able to see M22 in the finder. To see star hopping in action, visit the Fremont Peak Observatory.